Hey guys, welcome back to Ostrich Investing. Today we're going to talk about a company that trades at 12 times earnings, pays over a 3% dividend, is almost debt free, and has significant hidden real estate value. Today we're going to talk about a company called Leon's. So, Leon's is a stock that trades on the TSX. Who cares? Well, it's got strong insider ownership, 60% held by the Leon family. It's been around for over 100 years, relatively underfollowed. So the market cap's about 1.4 billion versus float of only 600 million, or a little bit less than that. The uh, company's been growing earnings over the last five years, but the stock has traded sideways. And then lastly, the current valuation looks attractive on the service at 12 times earnings, particularly given the low debt levels as well as significant hidden real estate value. So this video will review Leon's to see if it represents an attractive opportunity for investors, includes key considerations as well as bull, base, and bear case scenarios for the stock. Let's jump into it. So Leon's or the LFL Group is Canada's largest retailer of furniture, mattresses, appliance, and home electronics. Two major brands being Leon's and The Brick. E-commerce properties uh, also include the brick.com, leons.ca, and furniture.ca. And you can see that they've got a national presence across Canada here. For the five-year stock price, uh, you can see that it's sort of been choppy and traded sideways for the most part. It's kind of traded from a high of around $19 way back in 2015. Also touched around that level in 2017. It's dropped as low as a little bit beneath $14, both um, in early 2016 as well as in early 2019, and currently trading close to $17 a share, about $16.69. So as we mentioned, uh, the price to earnings, uh, actually not based on 2019, this is a typo, based on 2018, is just a little over 12 times, trades about two times price to book, and then just note here it is thinly traded. You can see the average volume here, roughly 17,000 shares a day. And again, that big part of that is that there's so much insider ownership. So now if we jump in and take a look at the financials, as I mentioned, over the last five years, it's, it's not been growth that you'd write home about, but it has been good, low, steady growth. So you can see revenue here growing from 2014 to 2018, nice and steady from a little over 2 billion to now uh, 2.24. Net incomes had nice growth up from just under 80 million up through to 110 or 111. And then shareholders equity per share has also had a nice trajectory as well. Um, on the next slide, I just wanted to take it back a few more years so that you could see uh, the acquisition of the brick. So Leon's announced the acquisition of the brick in late 2012, I believe they closed on the acquisition in 2013, and it was a $700 million acquisition. And you can see what it did to their revenue. It more than doubled it. So this was a transformative acquisition that they made uh, about seven years ago now. And again, not much more to say here other than kind of more than doubled, doubled the size of the company, and they've continued to grow since then. Taking a peek at how they've done year to date, Q3 2019 results. Um, you can see here, I think the first thing I wanna talk about is just the top line. So you can see revenue for the nine months year to date. Again, not huge growth numbers, but the business for a retailer in the space they're in is moving in the right direction. So revenue's up 1.4%. Same store sales again, uh, almost flat, but we'll give, we'll give them a check mark for being positive half a percent uh, up year over year. Next thing I want to talk about is the gross margin. So 43.3% in 2019 year to date versus 43.2. So again, steady and slightly climbing. No, no real uh, danger signs there. And then uh, the last thing on this slide, uh, adjusted earnings per share up 14% year over year. So. 96 cents for the nine month period year to date versus 84 cents uh, last year. And just point out the adoption of the IFRS 16 lease accounting affects adjusted EBITDA and uh, 
and net income that we talked about here had been adjusted to exclude that impact. But if you look at your adjusted EBITDA here, 202 million versus 126 is not comparable year over year. So that leads us to lease accounting. We are going to do a shallow dive, uh, not a deep dive, but we're going to do a shallow dive into uh, lease accounting for Leon's. Uh, so IFRS 16 basically eliminates the distinction between operating and finance leases, has a pretty large effect on most retailers that obviously lease significant space. Um, rent expense is replaced with depreciation and interest. And so what in Leon's case, they created a new asset and a liability. So the, the asset is a $430 million right of use asset and corresponding $415 million lease liability. And depreciation expense on the asset plus interest expense on the liability replace rent expense. So that's the accounting that's happening in behind the scenes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you want to see how that looks on the actual statements in their Q3 report, you can see adjusted EBITDA here uh, for the nine months, 202 million under the new IFRS guidelines. If they back out the impact of IFRS 16, uh, 66 million, you get $136 million of EBITDA on an apples to apples basis with the prior period. So you can see even on an apples to apples basis, EBITDA is about up about $10 million. <clears throat> and then on the cash flow statement, which is where everything uh, comes back to cash, you can again just see so the changes in depreciation increase significantly in 2019 and a big part of that is just related to the IFRS accounting. Same with the finance costs as well. <clears throat> Next point I wanted to talk about was leverage. So Leon's since making the app acquisition of the brick uh, about seven years ago has since used free cash flow to reduce debt over time. And you can see uh, I've put these calculations together Net debt to EBITDA has come off from 2.4 times back in 2014 to zero in, in 2019. Uh, so the current cash, uh, just a, a big footnote here below, <clears throat> they do have a significant cash balance of 179 million, and it also includes equity and debt securities that they hold, and that offsets the 173 million in debt that they have on, on the balance sheet. So it's not zero debt, but net debt of zero, I've also excluded the lease accounting liability that we just talked about on the previous slides. It's not pure debt in my mind. Of course, they're still on the hook for making those lease payments, but I haven't included that in this debt figure. And then the last point I'll make here, there's lots going into this calculation. They do have a 148 million deferred warranty plan uh, revenue. And here, when you buy appliances or mattresses, maybe not mattresses, but let's go with appliances, uh, they offer you warranty plan protection. You pay for that up front. Uh, they receive the cash up front, but obviously they do need to service and pay for um, the warranty servicing as it comes due. So uh, would note that zero net debt, but they do need to be able to fund any of that warranty plan work as it comes due. Okay, so let's talk about the hidden real estate value here. And this is something that management's talked about for uh, a few years, actually. So Ed Leon, the CEO, he came out in the 2018 annual report, and this is right in his letter to shareholders. He goes, at the end of 2018, LFL Group owned a commercial real estate portfolio of 4.2 million square feet, most of it located in the heart of Canada's largest and fastest growing communities. So really large portfolio of owned real estate. <clears> he <throat> goes on to say, while well, his portfolio is carried on Leon's balance sheet at historical cost, we're fully aware that it represents billions of dollars in potential residential and mixed-use development. And lastly, he, he specifies one such property, which is the 40-acre site that's home to their head office and showroom in West Toronto, has been an obvious focal point. Uh, in our consideration. I believe that the location of this site is quite central in Toronto. So company has been highlighting real estate value since 2016. If we go on to the next slide, you can see here, uh, previous CEO 
Terry Leon uh, in the 2016 annual report uh, had this quote through subsidiary Merley Holdings Limited and Leon's Holdings from 1967. So now you start to get the picture of why some of these properties, uh, the, the book value or historical cost might be outdated. Um, we also possess 271 acres of land and 3.6 million square feet uh, portfolio of uh, commercial real estate. So that's obviously gone up since then. Much of it in prime urban locations with enormous unrealized value and development potential. Uh, so here in the annual report, just pulled up the note, the land and buildings book value in the annual report and balance sheets listed at 208 million. And then they also have a uh, note nine is on investment properties and the market value for their investment properties is an additional 44 million, uh, according to them. So lots of real estate value embedded in the business, uh, doesn't really show on the financial statements, the management team and the Leon family has been talking about crystallizing that value, but they've been talking about it for over four years now and they haven't done anything. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Governance, uh, another point I wanted to just mention, when you buy a company that has significant insider ownership, the great thing is they've got a lot of skin in the game and very incented and aligned with you in terms of maximizing shareholder returns. On the flip side, uh, they control the board. So uh, this is going to be small on your screen, but five of the eight people here have a last name, Leon. Uh, so they control the board, uh, they control the business, and there's less of an opportunity for minority shareholders to uh, sway the decision making. So I just wanted to point that out. All right, uh, so we're pretty quickly into our key considerations for an investment in Leon's. On the strength side, we talked about earlier, it's a leader in its space in Canada. It's got a national footprint and it's got a hundred year operating history. So the brand, both for Leon's and the Brick, is very strong. Uh, if you look at some of the ratings online, it might have mis mixed reviews, but everyone's heard of uh, these two iconic brands. Another strength, they own significant unencumbered real estate. So not only is that a potential strength as an investor, but when you're in the retail space, um, having ownership of significant real estate just gives you a lot more flexibility to weather out any rough patches. Almost no debt, same thing, rock solid balance sheet would let you uh, weather the storm if you went through a, a tough period. And then we've got significant inside, inside ownership, about 60% held by the Leon family. Risks, it's a competitive industry, it's retail, um, increased online threat from Wayfair and Amazon. I think what I found interesting when I looked at the results, and to be honest, what surprised me is that there was consistent growth over the last five years. So despite you know increased penetration from um, digital competitors or just other competition, Leon's results are continue to be consistently up and to the right, albeit very modest. We're talking one to two percent growth but still uh, a nice trend to see. Another key risk here, risk here is the retail business has low margins. So Leon's has 8% EBITDA margins. And you gotta think that's including owning a significant chunk of their locations in real estate. Number three, some seasonality and potential for cyclicality, uh, dependence on consumer spending for large household items. So in Canada, uh, there's a lot of discussion around the housing market. It's continued to be a growth area and a big drive, driver of the economy. And you've got to presume that Leon's has benefited from that. And lastly, on the risk side, insider control of the board, just to be aware of that. Uh, if you invest in Leon's, you really are along for the ride with the Leon family. Key drivers. Uh, number one, same store sales growth. Uh, obviously, if each location continues to increase its revenue, we saw it's basically flat uh, or about half a percent growth recently. Number two, gross margins. Uh, number three, e-commerce growth. Or, and uh, just note that Leon's partnered with Shopify back in 2018. So they're not just sitting by the wayside. They're very much looking at, at growing uh, on the e-commerce side and they have those three properties, uh, the brick.com, leons.ca and furniture.ca. 
Number four, free cash flow and share buybacks uh, is another driver for the stock. Now that the debt's been paid down, it could look to uh, divert that free cash flow into other areas or potentially share buybacks would be a logical choice. And then lastly, real estate as a catalyst. All right, so now let's move into the illustrative scenarios, the bull case, the bear, bear case, and the base case for the stock. So on the bull side, I've assumed full crystallization of real estate value, and I've put a number in here at one and a half billion. Uh, so how did I get at this number? Really pretty quick and dirty assumption. Um, I think if you really were considering buying the stock, you'd want to do a lot more work here. You can look at the 4.2 million square feet. You can look at some publicly traded comps, REITs that have a retail focus and do a back of the envelope calculation. That's sort of roughly what I did here. It's What's tough is they've got some undeveloped land. You've got to imagine that the uh, the Toronto headquarters with 40 acres, that in and of itself could be a couple hundred million. Um, you could look at that uh, as a precedent or sorry, as a comparable and then go from there. Lots of ways to look at it, but I think, you know, pretty easily you'd think it's got to at least be a billion and then anything above that, um, you know, want to do a little bit more work. Here I've just started with a billion and a half. EBITDA is adjusted down for additional lease expense. So obviously if they did spin out a REIT or sell, do a sale lease back of the real estate, um, then the ones that are stores, they'd have to lease those back. So you're going to have to adjust down your EBITDA. And I, I brought that down from approximately 200 billion to 150. Again, just a quick assumption. Number three, we're assuming that the base business continues to grow modestly uh, and will value the remaining business at eight times EBITDA of 150 million. And again, no net debt here. So if you do all that, you get a billion and a half for the real estate. You're, you're left with um, uh, another billion for the actual business. And that implies a share price of $32.25 which is up 93% from the current share price of 1669. Base case. So let's assume they just keep talking about the real estate, but not doing anything. Um, <clears throat> they could keep talking about this real estate for years to come and not uh, crystallize the value. So in this base case, the base business continues to grow modestly. So again, think that one, 2% growth, but now instead of using the free cash flow for debt pay down, free cash flow is going to be used for buybacks. In 2020 earnings per share, assuming some share buybacks, $1.56, put a 14 times multiple on that. So instead of the 12, we're going up to a 14. And that implies a share price of $21.85. So you could get a 31% upside without them crystallizing the real estate. But just if the base operating business continues to perform and they start using free cash flow to reward shareholders. Bear case, um, <clears throat> let's assume growth does turn negative amid weakened cons Canadian consumer or increased competition. They would and could continue to use free cash flow for a buyback to partially offset the EPS, but your earnings per share would still decrease. Put a 10 multiple on that. Again, there's no debt here. Um, and the market should know that there's still that real estate value there, but a, a 10 multiple on $1.25 gets you an implied share price of $12.50, uh, which is a downside of 25%. So again, just illustrative here uh, to show you a few different scenarios. The other one that I thought about was a potential go private. If the family already owns 60% and the, and the market's valuing the business uh, well below uh, the value of the business and the real estate, they could attempt to take private. But I think here uh, there's so many family members that having a publicly listed entity is probably preferable where uh, the dividends flow and, and each family member can sort of choose how involved they want to be or what they want to do uh, with the dividends. So I think, and again, this is me just speculating here, <clears throat> public structure could be the preferred, preferred choice here. So I wouldn't bank on a go private. Conclusion. Leon's is in a tough space, namely retail, but it has shown steady growth over the past five years. Minimal investor marketing, so they've got no um, company presentations, they don't do conference calls. 
um, have allowed the company to quietly pay down debt and grow earnings without much movement in the share price. Hidden real estate assets could be a huge catalyst for the stock. I mean, the, these assets could be worth more than the market cap of uh, the company. However, with insider control, you have no control on the timing of such event, but you do get a 3% dividend while you wait. So if the underlying business continues to grow even modestly, I think there are several ways that you could do well as an investor, whether they do or don't crystallize the value of the real estate. So that's it for our video for Leon's. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Have I missed anything? We'll be back soon with more content, but until then, happy investing and don't bury your head in the sand.